the clock has ticked and the wait is over. The clock has ticked and the wait is over. My name is Hana Ali and I welcome you all to our third event of TEDx Glendale Academy. As Mark Twain rightly said, the two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you realize why. Life is indeed a labyrinth. However, every once in a while, we stumble across words and ideas that show us the way. TEDx is exactly that medium. It isn't merely an event. It's a union of minds that wonder how and minds that answer the same. It is a fiesta. Fiesta for those who are thinkers, educators, creators, learners, admirers, motivators, and those seeking motivation. Glendale Academy has always propelled its students to carve their own path and reap their own destiny. Where each day we learn and we love. Where each day the grandiosity of life is hidden in our attempts to discover and that is exactly what Glendale has taught everyone. Today, it's not just us, but a plethora of luminaries from across the world joining us from various facets like media, education, economy from India and around the world who will tell us about the motivation required to make our fervent attempts. So without further ado, I'd like to create the program with the official TEDx introductory video. Welcome to something special. Welcome to TEDx. This TEDx event is part of a global conversation that takes place every day in every corner of the world. In schools, in theatres, in workplaces, even in prisons, people gather to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. More than 3,000 TEDx events are held every year in 170 countries. It's a remarkable thing. TEDx events are self-organized under a license from TED, a nonprofit organization devoted to discovering and sharing powerful ideas in the form of TED Talks. It's not TED itself, but your local TEDx team of volunteers that has done all the work to put on today's event, including booking all of the speakers. It's this team's ideas, dedication, and time that have made this possible. We really hope today's program sparks an exciting conversation. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you will take out. And now, on with the show. Our first speaker is an IITN from Bombay. He has been the Dean and Deputy Dean of Indian School of Business here in Hyderabad and is currently Director General at Research and Innovation Circle of Hyderabad. I'm honored to welcome Mr. Ajit Rangnekar. Every day without fail, I tell my wife, you know, I want to be 18 again. I want to be a teenager again. I want to be a part of this wonderful change that is happening in the world. The immense opportunities that are facing the world today and which we can actually make an impact. And if I can't do it, I'm delighted today to be with all of you and you can do it. So what are some of these things and what is it that we are actually looking for? See, if you look around, today the world is full of stories about unicorns, right? Every day people talk about yet another unicorn, somebody worth more than a billion dollars, somebody worth five billion dollars, somebody worth ten billion dollars. Is that what life is about? Is that what we think drives us? You know, for the last more than 20 years, I've been working closely with startups and with young people like yourselves. And I've rarely seen a truly successful startup 
which started to just make money. Nobody does that. So what is it that people really do? What makes a successful startup? I'll tell you what I have understood from my own experiences. The first thing I find is that people who start something are passionate and I mean really, really passionate about solving a big problem that really needs solving. So they don't think about, oh, she made a billion dollars doing this, I will also do that. That's not typically what they do. They really solve something that is a big pain point today where they live. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, we can all wish, we can all wish that I can solve all the problems in this world. But do I have some ability? Do I have something unique that I can bring? That could be a technical ability, that could be access to data, that could be access to market, it could be anything, but it needs to be something special. And increasingly, what is happening now is that the kind of problems we need to solve and we can solve are more and more complex. And therefore, one person or a small group of people cannot solve these problems. And therefore, one more ability that these people have is an ability to bring together a very diverse team and make them into one cohesive group. And believe you me, that is not as easy as it sounds. And therefore, the last thing that these people need is an ability to lead such groups. And one more thing in that ability to lead, it is also governance and it is also ethics and values. I have not seen too many companies succeed with questionable ethics. I promise you that. Right? So that is the first thing, is that passion. The second thing is the ability. The third thing is perseverance and flexibility. Now sometimes they look opposite to each other, don't they? We say we are passionate about something, therefore we want to persevere. Easy to understand, right? And in this journey, you will find many setbacks. It's not easy to be an entrepreneur. Every day there are problems. People don't know you, people don't trust you, people say, why should I? What do you have? You, you are a little kid, what do you know about solving the world's big problems? Right? So there are so many prejudices, so many biases, so many difficulties that come in your way and you have to continue to persevere. Right? That's all right. But what does flexibility mean then? See, what happens is that when we go on this journey, we think that the road from here to there is this straight road. But straight roads, first of all, are well traveled. Everybody else has done it. If they have not succeeded, why would you succeed? So, what happens is that you have to try new roads, new paths. And when you think of those new paths, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. You know, if I ever write my autobiography, I think I've made more mistakes than I've succeeded. I've failed so many times, so many times on some of the things that I thought, well, this is definitely going to succeed. And they did succeed. So, therefore, you know what? That is where perseverance comes in. That's where flexibility comes in. That's where we need to really say, okay, I thought it was a great idea. I really believed in it, but somehow it doesn't seem to work. How can I come back and say what went wrong in it? Because the idea may not be wrong, but the way we are approaching it could be wrong. Sometimes what happens is you are too early with an idea, and therefore the world is not you know, willing to listen. Look at what happened you know, in around 2000 when the internet started, there were so many great ideas, but the world simply wasn't ready. It's only much, much later in 2009, 10 and later that many of those got. So, so there are many different reasons why you have to be flexible. So that's the third. 
the fourth is something that at least we in India somehow don't appreciate as much. That is an ability to tell your story. Just having passion is great. Having perseverance is great. Knowing how to solve it. But how do you bring everybody on board? How do you bring everyone to support you? Look at the great political leaders. You may say, oh, they are idiots, oh, they are biased, oh, they are something. But they have that ability to tell their story most convincingly. And every successful entrepreneur has that same ability. She can convince you to come and join her and support her idea. And therefore, you have to develop that ability, that ability to tell your story together with the passion is what makes the great combination. Right? So those are some of the ingredients that all of us need to have if we are going to really do something big, something that is transformational. Right? Now, I am not saying that every one of us must do something that is transformational. I think, you know, success should never be measured by did I build something big, did I make a lot of money, does the world know me, no. I think success should be measured by how happy you are, by how content you are and by, yes, when I look back, I did what I wanted to do. And I think I will underline that if I can underline that virtually. Success is doing what you want to do. But if you do want to change the world, if you do want to have a big impact in the world, what are some of the big things that are likely to be important in the future? If you see the world now, e-commerce was the first big thing. After that have come things like SaaS and you know, a few other deep tech. AI, ML has become all pervasive, etc. But where will you use this? Where can we use enormous great technologies like large data mining, AI, ML, IOTs, etc. So I'm going to suggest to you three big areas where I think you can make a big difference and the world and the society will be grateful to you. And the first is environment. Look around us. I was in Australia in late 2019 and there were fires everywhere. That was pre-COVID. Right? Then there have been fires, continue to be fires in the West in the United States. Vancouver, of all the places, had fires. Germany had floods. And now look at our own country. From Uttarakhand in the top to Kerala at the bottom, we have massive floods and problems in October. Just think of the massive changes and disruptions that are even in our own Hyderabad, we have had floodings last year. Something unheard of. So let us acknowledge and accept that lots of things need to be done. Now, in those, obviously we have to change our own behaviors, right? I cannot drive a big fancy gas guzzling car and take a private jet and go all over the world and then say I am concerned about the environment. So we have to do it. Governments have to do it. Let's face it. But the big things that we have to do is to see how we can use technology to quickly and effectively solve these problems. So that's number one. The second thing obviously is health. We've seen with COVID. Just making money is not enough. If one COVID can completely destroy your health, what is the use of all the money? And therefore, good health for all. And for all, I underline, not just for us people who are well, good health for all is going to be. And technology is going to really make health easily accessible across the world. So that's a big, big thing. For you. And I think, I hope many of you take food. And the last thing is food. As more people come out of poverty, they will eat more. And we cannot simply afford to have bigger farms and larger farms and do deforestation. So how do we become smart about using food? How do we use food that does not deplete the carbon? These are going to be some of the really big interesting problems that we solve. Once again, 
I want to emphasize, you don't have to take the responsibility of doing this. You are not interested in doing it. You don't have to solve just these problems. Your passion may be different. It could be sports, it could be entertainment, it could be anything. But whatever you do, follow your heart and do the best you can. Have a great life ahead. Good luck. For our next talk, we have an award-winning digital strategist and company director of Disruptors Co., a firm that facilitates incubation of innovation in enterprise and creators of the airworks. We have Ms. Joanne Jacobs here to guide us through the concept of learning by doing. American philosopher John Dewey once declared that we only think when we're confronted with problems. He was an education reformer who was born over 150 years ago and he established the first learning by doing laboratories in Chicago in the US at the end of the 19th century. He was visionary in the way he crafted education so that learners would always be solving problems, always curious, always energized by their learning experiences. Well, it's been a long time since Dewey was around and when he set the ground rules for learning by doing. But here we are more than a century later and because of the costs of delivering problem-based learning, we're still locked into a lot of rote learning in the classroom. And even when we do facilitate learning by doing, some of the methods that we use for supporting problem solving in education really haven't moved much over the last couple of generations at least. So today I want to present to you an alternative method of problem solving and the best bit is that it's not just for the classroom, it kind of can work in any context from your local community or your biggest corporate enterprise. It's something that I've been doing as a strategist and an educator for at least the last decade, and it's called a hackathon. So many argue that Gandhi's uh, 1929 design competition for sustainable communities was probably the precursor of what we now know as a hackathon. But it wasn't until probably the mid 1990s when the World Wide Web was being established that we started to formally bring together small groups of people to help build what became XML code or that one of the languages of the World Wide Web. And it wasn't really until the end of the 90s when Niels Provost coined the word hackathon to describe an event that was focused on cryptographic development for one of the Unix operating systems, OpenBSD. And since then, the concept has really developed immensely with standards for experiences emerging and by about the mid-2010s, mid about then, was when hackathons were really popping up all over the world uh, to solve all sorts of problems, social problems, business problems, tech problems, the lot. So it's not really a new idea, and hackathons really have been kicking around for a long time now, and yet there are still people who've never heard of a hackathon, never been to a hackathon, can't even imagine what happens at a hackathon, and how it could be used in the classroom or how it could be used in a business concept. But before the end of this talk, I want you to have in your mind a way that you could actually set up your own hackathon for your own classroom, for your training development, for your business, or even in your passion communities. Let's see how we go with that, shall we? So what is a hackathon and why is it useful as learning by doing? Well, it's an event where small teams of people, maybe four or five people in a team, will come together to create a solution to a defined problem. And it can happen over a few hours or a full day or a couple of days, which is the most common, or even for a full week if you happen to have that much time on your hands. It's rapid prototyping where teams research a problem, they build and test a solution, they pitch that solution to a panel of judges um, at the end of the event. Think of it as kind of like Shark Tank or like Dragon's Den. 
Um, and those presentations are time limited. So they have to present their ideas in a manner that proves that their solution is both desirable for the target end users, uh, that it's technical, technically feasible, organizationally implementable, um, that it's economically feasible. All these things have to be part of a really short, probably five minute or three to five minute presentation. Um, and at the end of the event, uh, when all the teams have presented, you maybe have one or a number of teams that could go on to turn their prototype into a real product or service. So a hackathon combines the research skills, the ideation, the building of prototypes, the sourcing of information around costs and, and benefits and testing of solutions, presenting. It's the most intense learning by doing you can possibly imagine. And it's extremely memorable because it has all those things in one event. So key, of course, to the success of any kind of hackathon is effective teamwork. And when it comes to team members in hackathons, we find the best teams kind of build diversity in. We say that the hackathon teams, the best teams usually have four H's of the hackathon, four identities. It's the hacker, the hustler, the hipster, and the humanitarian. So a hacker is a builder. That's somebody who gets their hands dirty, actually creating a particular solution. A hustler is someone with perhaps a little bit more business now or um, understands economics and might actually work on the cost benefit analysis for a particular solution. The hipster is the designer. Uh, that's somebody who might have come up with the idea of what the solution might be in the first place, or they might be just making it more attractive for the users. The humanitarian is somebody with lived experience. They're somebody who might have subject matter expertise, but think of them ultimately as the ultimate customer or user of a particular solution. And because of those time constraints of a hackathon, the responsibilities of the team members gets divided up along those four H's of the hacker, the hustler, the hipster and the humanitarian. And team members have to rely on each other. They have to respect the contributions of their, um, their teammates and they have to respect the process in order to be able to get the best outcome for a presentation at the end of the event. Hackathons are useful uh, as problem solving and as learning by doing because the teams just have such a short amount of time to work together. So they have to learn as much as they can about the problem itself. They have to come up with the solution, build it, test it, preferably with beneficiaries of the solution during the course of the event itself. It's prototyping. It's not just theory. So it's not just talking about a concept from a, a, a sort of a, a, a distant perspective. It's a quick build to provide a proof of concept rather than just the concept itself. And at the average hackathon, you, you can get sort of 10 ideas to prototype stage in about two days. So it's incredibly efficient. Uh, for business, um, hackathons are a lot cheaper than standard R&D, research and development, because instead of investing heavily in sort of long, drawn out research programs, it's a way to throw a lot of ideas out there and to consider which of those ideas are going to be the most feasible. Um, maybe only one or two of those ideas are feasible given the constraints of implementation. But instead of spending tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars in research and development uh, for ideas that may still not get off the ground after all, um, you're, you can come up with some clear evidence in a couple of days uh, that you have a solution that's going to be marketable or that is going to actually work in a particular business context. And even in a learning experience, even among school students, hackathons represent really good value for learning because through that ideation, through that technical solution development, um, through some of the economics awareness they develop through cost benefit analysis, and even through sort of social communication skills from team negotiation and present, presenting at the end of the event, students are getting 
a lot of learning in a single activity. So it's all good value. Um, so with all that value, um, have you started thinking about how a hackathon could, you know, work for you? What what would actually convince you uh, that a hackathon might be valuable? Maybe you need to think about who would be participating for the event. I mean, the greatest thing about a hackathon is really anyone can participate because it doesn't matter if you have no technical expertise. It doesn't matter if you have no history of working in business. Um, when you come together as a team, you'll find that that particular, your individual expertise will actually start um, to uh, benefit your team members. So it works for solutions um, that students build in the classroom. It works for teachers. We've actually, I've actually run it in the past for uh, helping teachers develop curriculum. Um, I've had it as a uh, for community groups that are building for social problems, tackling social problems in the community. And of course, we've used it in businesses uh, in enterprises for uh, tackling quite significant business problems. So it's a format that takes a short amount of time uh, for from your, from your normal working week. Uh, and then it creates the best potential impact overall. Um, very, very quickly. And it doesn't really matter about the age or the expertise or the cultural history or the, you know, the personality of the person. Every individual will bring something unique to their team. And of course, the best teams celebrate and, uh, and capitalise on that kind of difference within the team uh, and create, you know, something great uh, during the course of the event. So, have I convinced you yet? Uh, do you want to run a hackathon? Um, how might it work for you? Um, of course, a lot of the buzz of a hackathon comes from getting together uh, with other people. Uh, so hackathons have normally been run face to face. But of course, during the pandemic, um, a whole range of platforms and resources have been developed over that time um, to facilitate remote but real time collaboration. Uh, so you don't even have to be in the same space anymore um, where you used to be able to have to be in a, in a single place over the course of a weekend for a hackathon event. You can design hackathons for maximum engagement regardless of where people are now. Um, and you can even do hybrid events. They are, they're hard where some people are online and some people are in the room, but it is possible to do. Um, and in our experience, a standard a smartphone can be used uh, for connecting to team members uh, and even for physical product demonstrations if necessary during a during a pitch at the end of the event. So um, I'm hoping by now you've got a clear idea of how you might bring a hackathon to life. Um, of course, it comes down to logistics. Uh, it does take a bit of time to plan for a hackathon event. For business, we usually recommend about a six to eight week planning cycle for a hackathon. Um, it takes about that long to sort of set up the problem that's worth solving and to uh, create the resources that you need to ensure that people have the best experience at the hackathon itself. Same with community events, uh, where you're recruiting people from the public to participate in the hackathon itself. It takes a couple of months, really, uh, for people to put aside weekends or uh, periods of time that they can actually dedicate to focus on the problem. Because it really is one of those, it's that rapid prototyping, it's condensed participation. So you've got to give people the time to prepare for that kind of event. In the classroom, it's, you know, you can build it into group work activities. So you could literally have hackathons running every few weeks in the classroom and uh, you they all the students are learning great skills. You're inspiring the next generation of innovators. So it's an incredible experience for all. I can only say from my own experience of running these events and participating in these events, everyone comes out of a hackathon absolutely buzzed about the experience. They adore what they've created uh, and they're proud of being part of a great team. So, you know, it comes down to this, you know, Albert Einstein once said, learning is experience, everything else is just information. I believe hackathons are the best experiences for people of any age, 
any background, any capability, not just because it is a way to rapidly test ideas, but because learning to work together as a community, as teams, is the best way to solve some of the biggest problems facing the world today. So find an idea, find an issue that you're passionate about, consider things, problems that you might have in your business or your community or across your classroom subjects and bring people together to shape a better world. It's one of the most extraordinary experiences you'll ever have. Thanks. Well, that talk definitely brought out a change in me. We move on now with Professor Jeremy B. Williams, who has amazingly completed more than 30 years in the education sector, making his mark by publishing three textbooks, more than 40 peer-reviewed papers, and 50 other articles and papers. He is also the founder of a sustainable enterprise called Green School for Girls. Please welcome Mr. Jeremy. agreed with the comment made by Angelica Ponte, who is an activist in Bolivia, in South America, who complained that the world designed by men has destroyed its natural equilibrium. This lady you'll probably recognise, if you don't recognise you'll certainly have heard of her name, Nancy Pelosi is the Speaker of the US House of Representatives and she said at the conference, if I ruled the world, the one thing I would do is invest in the education of women. When women succeed, the world succeeds. You might think this is some sort of radical feminist agenda, but it's not a question of men versus women here. Here is the Minister for International Development Cooperation from Sweden, who at the conference had this to say. Women are not the polluters of this world, yet they carry the consequences of climate change on their shoulders. Without a gender perspective, we miss out on invaluable knowledge needed for a sustainable green transition. Which leads me to this quote, which I think encapsulates the case I am making in this presentation. An African proverb, a famous African proverb, reads as follows, if you educate a man, you educate an individual, but if you educate a woman, you educate a nation. Investment in women and girls has attracted a lot of attention in recent years, not least because of the Sustainable Development Goals and SDG 5 in particular, which focuses on gender equality. Indeed, so-called gender lens investing has also attracted attention from among the investment community and this is where the idea of a green school for girls a sustainable enterprise a social purpose business has come from it's not a charity it's not a business that is set up to maximize profit it's a business that looks to maximise social and environmental welfare. So what would school as sustainable enterprise look like? What if a community agreed to supply some land and that same community also agreed to supply some labour which could be used to construct a school building using locally sourced materials? And what if that school were powered entirely from renewable energy, from solar, from wind, from maybe biomass? And how would it be if that school were able to access the very best curriculum via high-speed internet? And what if the school were self-sufficient in that it had its own water supply using rain water harvesting techniques? What about if that school also made good use of any wastewater, recycling it for fruit and vegetable cultivation, animal products, not forgetting of course tree planting. What if that school, a girls school, 
when it wasn't being used as a school, became a focal point for the whole community, providing education and training, skill development for everyone in that community. So, is this an idea that could work? Well, we tried it. A few years ago, Green School for Girls, GS4G, was founded with a vision of empowering all girls to realise equal opportunity through education that was ecologically, socially and economically self-sustaining. Started from very humble beginnings, worked with a local community in Mumbai, we got some space in the back area of a local school, a local state school, and Green School for Girls was launched on a very small scale to begin with, bringing in a small number of girls from the local community. What we did started off with a curriculum that focused on food production, on water, on waste. These were the three key modules in the curriculum when we first launched it. And I've got some photographs here to show you a project that we started focusing on the production of soil, Amrit Mitti. And that involved collecting a lot of waste leaves, dry leaves that were um, collected in the local community. They were mixed with um, amongst other things, uh, cow urine, cow poo, um, to produce soil, which takes hundreds of years normally. We managed to produce soil in the space of three months, and uh, the girls were amazed when, within the space of a few weeks after that soil production process had concluded, they started to grow things in this soil that they had created. This is a picture on the roof of the school where we made raised gardens using uh, bricks that had been uh, cast aside and no one wanted anymore. After a while, we started the harvesting process and the girls were astonished that they themselves not only had manufactured soil, but they'd also grown food that they could eat themselves and of course they could sell. It became a business venture. Mothers also woke up to the fact that this is something that was good education, a broad education for their daughters, but it was also a way of providing for the households within the community. It wasn't just about food production, it wasn't just about learning about environmental things, we also focused on uh, using the internet to good effect by bringing in uh, various speakers from other parts of the world using high-speed internet. And we also introduced not just well-being in an economic and environmental way, but also about individual well-being and yoga was a central part of the curriculum as well. It's early days and there's a lot more that can be done with Green School for Girls. It started in India. We'd also like to introduce this same idea into other countries like Kenya and Sierra Leone. I hope you found this talk interesting. Known for her dynamic presence and versatility in her work, we have a celebrity MC, TEDx speaker, virtual and TV host, RJ, entrepreneur, celebrity presenters coach, winner of various awards. And honestly, I think I'll end up picking up the rest of the program if I keep going on about her achievements. So here's introducing Ms. Pallavi Valya Raj. It is only and only up to you to make those healthy choices today. No, I'm not just talking about healthy choices for your body. I am talking about healthy choices for your mind. Hi, I'm Pallavi Valya Raj, and I am super excited to have a very powerful conversation with all you awesome people today. So since we're going to spend some time together, do I have your permission to share a little bit about myself? As a professional, um, 
I have been a multi award winning celebrity MC, a global communications trainer and coach. I've also been, been an entrepreneur and a television host. I really want to have this conversation with you about the mental health crisis that I believe is the silent pandemic that's really gripping the world. Okay. And as a person who has fought depression not once or twice but four times in my life i definitely want to be able to share ways um, that you know that you can overcome uh, those mental health challenges if you are going through any when you have a positive mental health you can cope with stress a lot better in life. You're definitely a lot more productive as far as work is concerned. You realize your full and true potential. You start making those meaningful contributions, whether it is to yourself, your family, your friends, school, college, your community, the society around you, everywhere, okay? And I think that is priceless. Now, I need you to know something before we even move any further, that poor mental health is not not your fault and no one is to blame for it. Statistics say that an estimated 13% of adolescents aged 10 to 19 years are diagnosed with mental health disorders. Okay, suicide. Yes, you heard me right. Suicide is the fourth leading cause of death amongst um, the 15 to 19 year youngs. In India, 27 to 28 adolescents and young adults succumb every single day to something or the other, stress, panic attacks, depression, and so many other mental health disorders. And this uh, most certainly happens because we're not willing to address mental health in a normal way. There is always this fear of harsh words, of laughter, of abuse that creates a stigma around mental health and really makes it very difficult. It makes it so much harder, not just for you, but even for adults like myself to express our feelings, to come out into the open and tell the world that, hey, I have a challenge. Please know this, that um, whatever you've gone through in the past uh, uh, close to about two years and are still going through are unprecedented times, guys. Nobody living has gone through times like this. So nobody really knows 100% how exactly to handle the kind of things that you people are going through. During the pandemic, a lot of you have been completely disillusioned. There were so many reasons for it, but you know, one of the major reasons was that you studied very, very hard, but your exam suddenly got canceled. Okay. It was very last minute. You, um, felt like there was so much uncertainty. There still is uncertainty just by the way, you just didn't have uh the the time to deal with all of this and you realize that the effect of all these uncertainties is not just immediate but it's a long-term effect you know today i really want to be able to talk to you about mental health because like i mentioned just now uh, a few minutes ago i have experienced different levels of mental health challenges in my own life okay and i also want you to know this guys that you are not just prone to mental health challenges when things are not going right for you in your life okay let me give you this example from my own life i'm sure you'll understand much better the first time that i faced mental health challenges was immediately after i had won the glad rags mrs india world title in 2006 i have always been a very cheerful bubbly active sporty um, love my friends kind of person i love working out i absolutely love my work okay that's the kind of person i've always been and immediately after the the pageant you know obviously you're mentally emotionally physically tired so you want to take a break for one or two weeks that's perfectly fine and i thought that all of the things that were happening to me were happening because i was taking that one or two weeks off all right um, so figure this, I've never been a couch potato before 2006. I used to get up in the morning and I used to switch on the television and my husband used to leave for work. I used to be sitting in a particular place and watching uh, television. And I think he used to come back from work late in the evening. And believe me, I used to be sitting in the same clothes in front of that television in the same pose probably and just surfing channels. I had very erratic eating habits. Sometimes I would eat, sometimes I would binge eat, sometimes I would not eat at all. Okay. Um, 
I was getting very irritable for no rhyme or reason. I had stopped stepping outside the house. I stopped going down for my walks. I stopped meeting friends. Forget that. I stopped taking calls from my family, from my friends, from my closed ones. I used to avoid their calls. And in order to avoid their calls, I used to put my phone on airplane mode. Okay. And I used to avoid work calls. I was low. I was disturbed when it came to night sleep i don't think i've slept well in in those in that particular period so you might think okay pallavi how long did this last few uh, more weeks maybe a couple of months six to seven months i had not stepped out of my house for about six to seven months that's how crazy bad the situation was now everybody who's watching me here right now okay i need you to understand this to know this that it is normal for people to sometimes feel low sometimes you know uh, have a lack of motivation in their life sometimes have trouble sleeping but hey if these signs all these signs that i've just mentioned to you okay these are all not signs of mental health problem if they continue only for maybe one or two weeks but if these carry on for more than a couple of weeks and then maybe drag into months it is important to have conversations reach out guys reach out to your parents reach out to people you trust reach out to counselors just reach out i personally uh, i want to tell you this with a hand on my heart there is nothing wrong with getting help okay so i want to ask you this when we fall sick don't we go to a doctor we see a doctor right it is the same thing with mental health as well why are we treating it any differently okay so just a quick reiteration if you kids are seeing yourself feeling do down and low and exhausted and hopeless and tearful and very very emotional all the time if you're showing sudden uh, changes in your behavior if your eating patterns sleeping patterns are disturbed if you're you know not performing at the best of your capability in school suddenly uh, you're fighting with your besties you're avoiding your friends in fact you have some physical ache or pain somewhere in your body you're just being very very aggressive oh my god all of these are things that you that that should put the red flag up for you i don't just want to help you help yourself if you see a friend or a classmate going through similar symptoms just reach out to them and have a normal conversation with them about their life okay whatever it is i mean the food they eat the, the kind of activities they do whatever just be kind in your conversations be kind in your dealings with those kind of people understand them create that space for them to start opening up to you because that's very crucial and if you feel that they need help please reach out to your school counselor and share your concerns about your friend understand that anxiety depression and panic attacks are not signs of weakness guys they are signs that you have been trying to remain strong for far too long you don't need to be that strong all the time okay now how many of you would like to understand how you can overcome these mental health crises come on that's that's the way forward yes thank you very much so these are things that i've taken as action steps uh, in order to come out of my depression all right first thing try and meditate start with just 5 minutes a day there are guided meditations there are just calming music just spend that me time without people around without gadgets around meditate please guys it will help you loads please have some kind of physical activity in your life get the sun yes get some sun into your life because you know what sunlight and darkness trigger the release of hormones in our brain all right so uh, sunlight is known to trigger the the hormone serotonin okay and that is the happy hormone all right that is the hormone that allows you to um, boost your mood or it's associated with boosting your mood okay and it's basically a, a hormone that allows a, a person to feel very calm and very focused so please get some physical activity and definitely get the sun reduce your screen time no i'm not just talking about video games here binge watch uh television for let's say 2 3 days because i'm giving you a guarantee that on the fourth day you will feel completely depressed because you feel purposeless you feel lost okay you feel like you wasted a lot of your time social media is basically a place where people share the highlights of their lives and when we go through those feeds we start comparing our normal everyday life to the high points in other people's lives and that's where the challenge starts because suddenly you feel like a loser suddenly you feel like you're missing out suddenly you feel like hey i'm getting left behind 
my life has no meaning so cut social media time please create a rough daily uh, structure uh, for yourself and follow it guys okay this is super super crucial at uh, um, for, for you people because i know that you have some time that you spend in school or college and those many hours are fixed after that time the number of hours that you have break it down have that uh, structure in place okay one hour is my free time me time i will do uh, the stuff that i love doing at that point in time two hours of study after that then after that i'm going to take a one hour physical activity break i'm going to go to the gym or you know run or do something where i'm just going to feel um, physically elated okay half an hour of time with my friends i want to chit chat i want to gossip half an hour of family time so so important so put that structure in place this is my sleep time i must sleep by this time i must get up by this time put that structure in place believe me it will make you feel like you have more control over your life have family time if your family says they are super busy demand that time from them it could be dinner time where everybody has dinner together but some families cannot so i would suggest that allocate 30 minutes a day minimum to just spending time with your family you all could play a board game together you all could just sit around and talk you all could just discuss uh, you know how your days were your high points your low points you all could just you know just laugh together but without the television and without any gadgets it's just you you people as a family okay another wonderful way is getting a good night sleep i know i know that at your age sometimes you want to stay awake late into the night but guys sleep is not just important at all ages especially so at your age super super important okay this is one thing that has helped me get um to my uh, troubled times so much okay writing a journal i don't just mean a diary or a journal you can even write on loose sheets of paper just express yourself completely and fully on that on those sheets of paper uh, so my suggestion for you is keep about 15 to 20 minutes in a day it could either be just before you go to sleep so that you kind of you know uh, put all that clutter out on paper and then you sleep peacefully or if you start your day like get out of your bed and just do about 15 to 20 minutes of writing so when you put stuff down on paper there's a lot of clutter there's a lot of noise which is actually releasing on paper and you will see for yourself that you will be a lot more focused a lot calmer or you will feel a lot lighter when you do this one final thing i want to share with you please have conversations with people have a safe person that you can rush to no matter how big or how small uh, um, the stuff you want to discuss a safe person is somebody that you know is an adult somebody your parents know as well somebody you connect with and yes most certainly somebody who listens to you without any judgment this person does not need to be your family does not need to be your family um, uh, distant family either definitely does not need to be your parents apart from them some adult who they know and they trust and you connect with who is your safe haven so to speak okay just go and pour your heart out all right how many of you would really like to take some action and commit commit to taking baby steps at least one step to begin with yes thank you very much if you can promise yourself that trust me that's all you need guys to live your awesome life your mental health is a priority so please make it your priority it's not somebody else's priority okay i want to leave you with this that your self care is a necessity your happiness is essential for the the successful superb life that you or to yourself okay your happiness depends only and only on yourself so go out there and be super happy and battle this out all right thank you I'm at a payphone trying to call home all of the change I spent on you. Where the times gone, baby, it's all wrong. Where are the plans we've made for two? Yeah, I know it's hard to remember the people we used to be. It's even harder to picture that you're not here next.
ask me, say it's too late to make it, is it too late to try? And in our time you wasted all the bridges burned down, I've wasted my nights, you turn out the lights, now I'm paralyzed and stuck in that time when we call it love, but even the sun sets in paradise, I'm out of my phone trying to call home all of the change I spent on you, where are the times? God, that it's all wrong, where are the plans we've made for two? If happy ever after did exist, I would still be holding you like this. All those fairy tales are full of it. One more stupid love song, I'll be sick. Cause I'm out of faith. You turned your back on tomorrow. Cause you forgot yesterday Gave you my love to borrow But you just gave it away Can't expect me to be fine Don't expect you to care No, I've said it before But all of our bridges burned down I've wasted my nights You turn out the lights Now I'm paralyzed in the sky That time when we called in love But even the sun sets in paradise I'm out of place, I'm trying to call home all of the change I spent on you. Where have the times gone, baby? It's all wrong. Where are the plans we made for to move? If I be ever after it exists, I would still be holding you like this. And all those fairy tales are full of it. One more stupid love song, I'll be sick, cause I'm out of place. Thank you everybody, thank you. I am more than honored to introduce our next speaker, CDR Bimal Raj. After serving 17 years in the Indian Navy, Mr. Raj continues to contribute greatly to our society by setting up three startups and is a certified mindset mentor and executive coach. Hello kids, I have 12 minutes to share a lifetime of uh, experience and learning. So I'm going to dive right in. Okay. Uh, these are the days of instant gratification and instant solution, even when it comes to all our problems. But I'm not here to give you an instant or magic solution for all your problems. However, what I have to offer you is one question. This one question I've asked myself when I, things were not going my way, when I was down on luck and more broke than a teenager whose pocket money has been cancelled for like six months. It will take courage on your part to ask yourself this question. But if you can gather the courage and answer this one question every time you are down and out, it will not only make you stronger as a person, but it will act as your guiding light and give you the inspiration uh, to move forward in life. But first, let me introduce myself. I am Commander Bimal Raj and I've served in the Indian Navy for 17 years. I'm an internationally certified coach and trainer, an NLP practitioner, and a teen parenting mentor. I've interacted with thousands of parents and kids over many years. Now, talking about my life, my life has been a roller coaster with lots of incidents uh, all through. And today, I want to share just three incidences in my life uh, to help you understand the question I was uh, referring to in the beginning. Okay. Now, the first one, my first dream in my life during my school years was to join the armed forces. Uh, and I achieved when achieved it when I joined the Indian Navy after my 12th. I did my BTEC in mechanical engineering and I went on to do uh, marine engineering specialization. Now, one part of the specialization course was that I had to do six months of watchkeeping on board a ship uh, to get myself certified that I was qualified uh, to handle one watch of the engine room. Now, halfway through the watchkeeping, I met with a very major road accident. I had a head-on head -on collision with a truck uh, and I was on my bike. Uh, it put me on a hospital bed for two long years and totally changed my career from a seagoing officer to a desk job. Uh, it was the most devastating incident of my life till uh, that time. 
my life, my career, my goals, my ambition, my dreams, everything came crashing down because I could not go back to uh, any ships because of my medical condition. Now, the second incident happened a few years after the, uh, after the bike accident. I do not normally share this uh, as when I look back today from where I am today, uh, I see it as something silly. But when I went through it, it was something terrible for me. Uh, also, you need to know this as many of you might uh, go through something similar in your youth as well. Now, a couple of years after the accident, I fell in love with a girl. Okay, we were very serious about uh, and serious and committed uh, for a few years, and we decided to get married. Uh, I met her family. I became like one of the, her family members. I even took leave and went home and uh, shared with my parents. And I, in fact, told them that her parents were uh, coming over to meet uh, my parents. But uh, on the fourth day, I was. Uh, at my home, she called me, called me late at night and she told me that she was breaking up with me and just cut the phone. I was perplexed. I didn't understand what was happening. I tried calling her back, but there was no response. Uh, it took me a week to reach back to Mumbai where I was posted and I came to know that she was getting married to my best friend. <laughs> Interestingly, he was someone whom she considered as the brother that she never had. Uh, I also found out from him only that it was the girl, it was she, my fiancée, who approached him and not the other way around. It was a terrible time for me, uh, especially emotionally. And our relationship was something that not too many people knew about it. So I had to suffer silently and it was really, really bad. Now, the third incident, I'll come to the question after this. The third incident that I want to share with you uh, is about the time I was wiped out financially. It, this was huge for me because by then I was married. I had a family, I had a child and I was nearing 40 and I was supposed to retire financially because my wife was doing a business and I was helping her and we did fantastically well in the business and we became dollar millionaires in just about five years of a lot of hard work. Uh, and we got introduced to an investment and fund manager through a very close friend of ours. And uh, we started investing all the money that we learned with, uh, that we earned with him because he had a plan for us to retire uh, by the time I was nearing 40. And he even gave us good returns initially. But when it was time to reap the benefit. That's when we learned and we realized that he was a fraud. Uh, he had not even invested any of the money that we had given him. And he had forged all the papers and the investment details. And since we were not financially savvy at that point in time with respect to investments and stocks and all, uh, we had taken it at face value uh, because it was also true that he was introduced to us by somebody whom we trusted a lot. Now, this was the worst because we had put everything into this into this retirement plan. From a dollar millionaire, we were reduced to having just a few thousands in our savings bank overnight. And I was staring at starting life from scratch at 40. I hope none of you have to face such a bad situation like an accident or getting wiped out financially. But I'm sure that most of you will have your hearts broken in one way or the other. It could be by the love of your life, by the profession you choose. Uh, it could be even by a pet who chooses to shower all its his or her attention at a different family member. The degree would vary, but the heart does take a beating, isn't it? Yeah. Now, now, remember in the beginning, I, was, I told you I was not here to give you some golden secret that will change uh, your life completely and take away all your problems. But I have one question, a question that probably saved my life too. Uh, so when I met with the accident for the first three months in the hospital, I was depressed and I was miserable because I was constantly asking myself the wrong question. And the question was, why me? I could list out all the reasons why this should not have happened to me. And I could not find any logical reason to receive this kind of a punishment. I was a good person. I had never hurt anyone uh, knowingly. And I've always tried to help people. Then why me? What wrong did I do? That was the loop I was in. After about three months of misery, I realized one thing that I was asking myself the wrong question because it was not only making me miserable, but it was not helping me change the situation even one bit. That is when I found the power within me 
to ask myself a different question. So from, from why me, I change my question to what next? To remember that the quality of your life depends on the quality of questions you ask yourself. Now, it is not easy to ask yourself this question because you need to first accept the situation you are in and accept the responsibility of your life, of your future, of how you want to move forward from that point on. I had to accept all the medical limitation that the accident had put on me. Uh, and I kept asking myself, what next? Because I didn't like the way I was. I wanted to live life to the best of my potential. And that accident broke my bones. Thankfully, my spirit was intact. So remember these two words, what next? Understand that life never stops moving along for anything or anyone. You will have good days, you will have bad days, you will have horrible days, and it's up to you to come out of these stronger. When my fiancé chose to break my heart, I asked myself, what next? I was heartbroken naturally at that point in time because I didn't have many people to talk to. Then one senior who is a very respected person in the corporate circles, he invited me home for lunch and he shared a very similar incident that had happened to him as well in his younger days. I couldn't believe my ears. I realized that things like these do happen to good people as well. I Till then, I was thinking that I was the only one who suffered such a massive heartbreak, very unfair one. Now, hearing him and talking to him helped me come out of my misery. Now, when you're going through some situation, especially something that is very emotional, make sure that you talk to people. If you see somebody who is down emotionally, talk to them. Know that you're not the only one in this world who goes through heartbreaks and letdowns. Ask yourself the question, what next? When we lost all our money and had to lie from scratch, I asked myself the same question, what next? Just that at that point in time, I was able to ask this question much faster. Now, decision making is like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it becomes. I knew that there was no point in crying over what we lost. I did file a case and all, but my entire focus was in moving forward uh, in life because uh, by then I realized that these two words had the power and had all the answers I was looking for to dig myself out of the pit that I, was, I had fallen in. Uh, remember that this one question with just two words can help you get through any challenge that you face in your life. Yes, you will go through a period of uh, sadness and mourning. That is fine. It's natural. Especially uh, you will have it more if you have not practiced asking this question. But during this time, make sure that you talk to people, uh, share your feelings and emotion, write your feelings and emotion, let those emotions come out of you. But once you've done that, take a deep breath, smile, and get ready for your life ahead. Get ready for the next adventure that life throws at you and ask yourself this question, what next? Thank you. Imagine achieving greatness from the mere age of 13. Indeed, Ms. Shweta Parag got her name in the Limka Book of Records at the age of 13 for being a part of India's first TV channel run by children in a school. Since then, she has explored over 30 roles in media and education. I'm sure a lot of us recognize her as a journalist and producer with many different media houses like Star News, TV9, Times of India, Sahara Sarme, Hangama TV, Midday, Radio 194.3 and many, many more. All before becoming an entrepreneur and starting her project, Purple People Labs. Hi, my name is Shweta Parak and I run an organization that is called Purple People Labs. Purple because, well, it's the color of creativity and wisdom. People because when I started it, I was alone and I have always been looking for a team that comes together for the same purpose why it was started. Labs because it's a place where you can come and make mistakes, you can learn from your mistakes and you can create something that is original, that is eccentric, that is crazy, but it is something that inspires love, something that inspires your dream. Um, well, this started out of a very simple idea 
something that I experienced as a child. So when I was home, I was always told to speak my mind, to be myself. But when I was outside, whether in school, whether in my tuition class or whether with my relatives, I was always asked to keep quiet. Come bolo, okay? Because I would be that child who would always raise her hand up, always have something to say. So I thought I want to create a place where people can come, speak their mind, uh, be mad and create something different. So as the first purple person, I created something out of what I love. So I love traveling, I love children, I love watching films, I love listening to and telling stories. So I created the first project in Purple People Labs that is a film school that runs for children. When I started, um, I started with the idea of creating interesting film labs or media labs in schools. So for five years, I traveled from one school to the other, one city to the other and uh, I was wanting to create a studio. In the process of these five years of meeting different schools, different children, we ended up producing 200 short films that went to 50 international film festivals and told stories from more than 3 lakh children. But I was unhappy. I was never feeling accomplished because my goal set in my mind was that I want to create a media lab or a studio inside a school. So I was always feeling like I am failing. I was feeling like a failure because, well, failure was really new to me. As a child, I was that child in school who would always come first in all the competitions, salad making, speaking, dancing, you name it, everything, everything except for sports. So for me, failure was new, rejection was new. So when I was walking into a school and they would say no for the program or I was you know, meeting people, meeting brands or meeting them, they okay, this is my idea, this is what I want to do and they would not reply back. I would feel like a failure, I would feel rejected, okay. And I started taking that to my heart. Uh, but I could not see something unique that I was doing in these five years because my goal was set in my head that I want to make a studio. But I could not see that I was running a film school out of a small suitcase, out of a small bag. That is something that one of my friend made me realize. He said, Shweta, you're doing something so amazing. You've made like 200 films just out of two cameras inside a bag and uh, a small edit editing system that you have out of this bag. And I was like, hey, I think, well, that's, that's actually an amazing idea. That could, that could be the next thing I want to do. So instead of the studio, I then shifted to what I already had with me. And that was a small suitcase out of which I was running uh, the film school and I called it cinema school in a sanduk and imagine the love that I got for it that a uh, few NGOs came forward and they funded this program so I could take this cinema school in a sanduk, sanduk is a bag, to villages and teach filmmaking to children. So I got to travel to villages, I met people from completely different cultural backgrounds, different demographies and we made some amazing films. You know, um, when I was told to talk to you all today, uh, to share something inspiring, I was thinking, what is it that I'm going to talk about? Uh, should I talk about the amazing things that I've experienced, the different people that I've met, uh, the good things that I've done? But I felt, uh, if I want to talk to you about something inspiring today, I want to talk to you about failure. I want to talk to you about failure because I know you all are listening to a lot of success stories. But I think my story is a story about failures because every time I failed, uh, I learned something new, I created something new out of it and I'm quite happy and proud about it. So it all started when I was just 13 years old and I became a part of India's first TV channel that uh, was being run by kids in my school. Thanks to my school for that opportunity. Uh, and I felt that, okay, I want to do something in media, I want to do something where I get to talk, I get to be on television, I get to talk to a lot of people. And that's where the idea of Purple People Labs also came from. When I started this, uh, uh, you know, I felt, oh, wow, I have an amazing idea. Everybody is going to love it and everybody is going to do what I want to do out of it. When I started meeting people, uh, they started giving me advice and they started giving me guidance as per the goals they had in life. So I would meet someone, they would say, 
oh wow this can scale into a really big business oh wow this you can reach out to why do you want to work with only 100 people you can probably reach out to 1 million people um oh why are you charging such less fees you know this is a great business model etc in that process i somewhere forgot what my purpose was okay let me remind you when i started this i said the reason why i started purple people labs was for one purpose that is to make a difference and to create a space where people can come exchange ideas and create something new but in the process of doing what i was doing and meeting different people i started listening to the various purpose that they had so let's say the purpose was oh you could become a multimillionaire oh you can you know become an influencer you can become this you can become that and somewhere i i i lost the core idea of where i had started it and i started measuring myself um with the goals that other people were setting for me instead of the goal that i had set for myself um so it so happened one of my own mentors ended up telling me that hey when small men try to cast long shadows the sun is about to set on them i was destroyed at 19 years old i was destroyed because my own mentor who i'm looking up to said something like that to me i took it to my heart after some time i created a campaign that was called small is big and well the learning that came from that failure from that that sentence that he told me was to realize that it's okay to take a small step it is okay to do something small because if you're doing something small but it is significant enough to match the purpose that you live for it's good i mean it's okay um a second thing that happened with me is you know as a teacher as a, a traveler as a filmmaker your world is restricted to your your team your world is restricted to your students your world is restricted to uh, you know the parents who put the faith in you for me it was my team also of course um, a lot of people walked in and walked out every time somebody would go i would feel like a failure i would feel like i made a wrong decision i would feel like i'm doing wrong but i realized that it's a part of a process it's it's not a failure of course i made the right decision i chose the right people for the right time you know like uh, there's a saying they say there are some people in your life who come for a season some come for a reason and some for a lifetime and if you can keep that in mind you will never see people walking in out of your life in and out of your life as a failure you know sometimes you feel oh my friend betrayed me or the guy i love betrayed me or somebody betrayed me nobody betrays you uh, everybody comes into your life for a purpose like i said for a reason for a season or for a lifetime similarly another thing that happened with me is um, when i started my entrepreneurial journey as a girl as a woman uh, there were a lot of questions that were raised on me i have gone through some weird questions i i'm going to pick some some that that are coming to my mind right now first one was how old are you i said i'm 32 oh you're not married oh you're not thinking of getting married if you're going to keep traveling like this and making films and being from one place to the other it will get so difficult for you to run a house second was oh what does your father do where are you from my father is into jewelry business my i'm from rajasthan oh then why are you doing all this why do you even need to do all this i'm like hello that's what my father does this is what i want to do this is what i'm capable of this is what my purpose in life is um i've also come through some people who've uh, asked me a question like are you a vegetarian or a non vegetarian well this is happening between a negotiation you know like when i'm discussing my business model or i'm discussing my cost and somebody would be like oh you're a vegetarian or non vegetarian i would be i'm a vegetarian jen you know all vegetarian animals are fat you should uh, you know what was the purpose of this person saying this to me just to distract me from the conversation that was happening and somebody had the audacity to body shame me uh, i've had I, i cannot take names and i cannot really say who the people were uh, what position they were in i can just say that you know who've crossed their 50s um, running big organizations and uh, when they lose a verbal battle with you they will pick on something that that can pull you down okay and the easiest thing to tell a girl who is overweight is to basically comment on her weight and the person will feel that you will stop the conversation but that never happened to me i love my body uh, i i love who i am uh, but at the same time i realize that in that anger and being that rebellious oh i'll show you no matter what body i am in i'm still going to be good i'm still going to be successful 
I did not concentrate on my health and that is one failure that, that I see as a failure that I want to overcome. Uh, I am working on it, I am trying to work on it and it is okay, you know, I mean it is okay what people tell you, but what you hear and what you take to your heart and what you take, what you take to your head is completely on you. You know, sometimes it is okay to take things to your heart, okay. Um, it is okay to take things to your heart, it is okay to cry, it is okay to get angry, it is okay to just, just let your emotions out, but do not let it go to your head because if it goes to your head, uh, you will slow down. Your, your head should always be in place. Your heart will understand, it will take its time to heal and you should let that happen. Um, one other failure, one of one failure that uh, has happened recently and something uh, that really, really shook me. One of my own student, you know, my, my own student, my, my, my brother, my friend uh, ended up telling me that, oh Shweta, you have been a failure for the last 8 years, you know. I was shocked and I was crying, I was in tears, I was in, I was in tears and uh, I was in tears not because I felt like a failure, because it is because I felt like I felt like I failed at the love and faith that I have put in someone. But I realized that he was judging me on the basis of what success means to him. What success meant to him probably was, oh, you are not a millionaire, you have not made a lot of money. But hey, the whole reason why I started Purple People Labs, the purpose was not to make money, but to make a difference. The purpose was not to reach a million people, but to reach to reach people significantly in, in a way that, that they can tell their stories, in a way that things can change for them. Are we doing that? Well, we are and that is why I think, uh, you know, when we go through failures, it is important to just look back, to look within yourself and see why you are doing what you are doing, where you are, why you are there and you will realize that there are no failures, there are only learnings. And if you can stick to your core and stay true to your purpose, you will embrace and love the failures that are happening uh, in your process because then you will start learning from them and that is how you will be successful. successful. Successful in the eyes of who you want to be, whether you want to be, you want to be mad, you want to be crazy, you want to be amazing, that success is your benchmark and if you want to stay at that find your purpose, be yourself and uh, one last thing that we always say in Purple People Labs is go purple. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Ganesh Mandadi, an author, motivational speaker, farmer and philanthropist. He is a devoted nature lover and also released his book, Your Life Graduation. He is here to give us his personal insight on the purpose of life and his vision mission. Human beings deserve to lead a heavenly life rather living in multiple hells in some or other walks of their lives. In other words, everyone deserves to lead a heavenly life on this planet before aiming an eternal heaven. The hard reality is that over 90% of human populations are depriving in some or other walks of their lives. and. There is no exceptions of being rich or poor, male or female, literate or illiterate and irrespective of one's faith and ethnicity, everyone is subject to the nature's law of equality. Leading a heavenly life is not necessarily to lead a life of pleasures and comforts. It is all about leading a meaningful and purpose-driven life towards sustainable happiness for the true life fulfillment and contentment. It is also important to understand that life fulfillment is not just about joy and happiness but sorrows and tears as well. It is not just about success and achievements, but failures and life lessons too, where a fulfilled life is a sum of all those human experiences. Today, I am here to speak about the essence of life graduation. Well, almost every one of you are quite familiar with the term academic graduation and you might wonder what is this life graduation is all about. Life graduation is about leading a fulfilled life with true contentment in all walks of your life and sustaining it throughout one's life journey. It is all about attaining basic life mastery in all the essential life ingredients in the 10 life fulfillment empires, which includes your right mindset, your personal set, your health set, 
your family set your heart set your professional set your financial set your social set your spiritual set and your philanthropic set it is neither too late nor too early to attend your life graduation where it applies to all age groups from high school students to elderly people irrespective of their socio economic status however i believe this is more important for the students and younger generations to build their self awareness on the essence of life graduation so that they can embrace and practice essential life ingredients to lead meaningful and fulfill lives pursuing life graduation can make huge difference in one's life rather realizing it too late simply because human life is too short to experiment the priceless and timeless wisdom on life fulfillment where the core essence on life fulfillment remains same from past several centuries we have been witnessing in the human history that some people rose to the highest professional fame or accomplishment and often deprived in their relationships or in their mental or emotional well-being what is the point in amassing to the riches or rising to fame and if you don't have anyone to share your happiness and if it doesn't provide you the inner peace we have seen some people who have obsessively amassed massive wealth and in the process they have disconnected with other essential life ingredients which is no good what is the point in being richest person and you wake up early morning with stress and fear of losing some people attain internal peace and are spiritually enlightened but are deprived in basic essentials and some even struggle for two meals a day what is the point of being blissful internally and are deprived of basic life essentials some people inherit massive wealth either through self made or through parental legacy but they lack financial discipline and financial literacy which eventually leads to bankruptcy or financial distress which is no good in all the above cases people are heading towards the opposite direction of life fulfillment where it is imminent and eventually they fall apart in their lives while majority of the world population lack holistic view of life fulfillment or they lack true essence of life fulfillment since most of them pursue life fulfillment ingredients in bits and pieces which never forms a meaningful shape or they stuck in certain ingredients and they give up in the process while other gets obsessive about selective ingredients and they attain highest levels while they ignore other essential life ingredients which is not good at the end one need to understand the life's basic principle where after certain level of wealth the next million is not going to revolutionize one's life likewise many such things and external possessions after certain level will not revolutionize our lives i was one among them who was chasing life fulfillment without having complete self awareness on the essential life ingredients i often stuck in material and lifestyle pursuits though i am successful in material world and in spite of being peak performer in my professional career i often change my jobs and work locations across the countries in search of life fulfillment i discovered my life purpose too late in my life and i took the courage to quit my 17 years of highly rewarding corporate career to pursue my entrepreneurship and farming passions however my real transformation happened during covid-19 pandemic in 2020 where my complete family sailed through a traumatic phase after testing positive for covid-19 the standstill days for a while during those pandemic days unfolded my intuitive dots from my past life experiences the deep rooted self reflection enabled me to connect those dots which redefine my life purpose and life vision and also inspired me to author my first book titled your life graduation it is a self awareness blueprint combined with my lifetime experience learnings and my obsessive study for over two decades on life fulfillment right from my school dropout days to attaining basic life mastery in all facets of my life where life fulfillment is neither a direct goal nor a single goal it is a by product of multiple goals in all facets of one's life your life graduation book is part of my philanthropic vision to strive and spread my little wisdom to everyone by unfolding your life treasures in all those 10 life fulfillment empires however my intent here is not to shed light on your life graduation book but it is about the essence of embracing essential life ingredients whether you build a required self awareness from self help literature or from any other sources as we are the most blessed generation living in information age with oceans of knowledge and wisdom around at your fingertips to acquire and the downsides of information age is that we are often drowned under information overload one should master the art to maneuver the from drowning or drifting away from the life graduation path due to information overload 
to begin your life graduation journey you need to conquer the first life fulfillment empire called right mindset which lays the base foundation for the rest nine fulfillment empires which is about rewiring your mindset by erasing your limiting beliefs and uprooting your negative thoughts it is about busting your fears and phobias to unfold your life treasures it is about unlocking the powers of your subconscious mind and sowing the empowering seeds to enrich your right mindset to empower your life purpose and life goals and if the right mindset lays your life foundation your personal set the second life fulfillment empire which forms core pillars of your life it upholds your life ingredients its values its structures which carries a load of rest all other fulfillment empires hence the stronger you lay the foundation and core pillars in the form of your right mindset and personal set the stronger you can build the other life fulfillment empires in your life personal set is about unlocking your life purpose your personal vision and mission it is about rebuilding your brand new personality and sustaining it by enriching your internal and external traits more importantly it is about the essence of owning your life and realizing your life goals health set is your third fulfillment empire and we all know that once biological body is the only place where we live 24 by 7 and every second throughout our life span it is about owning your health your body's functional and metabolic efficacy and its ability to adapt to the physical mental and social dimensions of life health set is about the essence of nourishing your body its energy levels and vitality with balanced nutrition quality sleep physical fitness by adapting healthy lifestyles it is also about the essence of nourishing your emotional mental and spiritual health and building sustainable health which determines your quality of life family set is your fourth fulfillment empire way sociologists perceive family as a nucleus and soul for any society where it passes legacy morals and social values for generation it is about the essence of family life where most people trade profession over family relationships but overlooks the simple fact that you are a product of your family for the professional world it is about the essence of nurturing your family roots and unlocking the powers of your fa- family bonding and marriages it is options in positive ways to relieve stress communicate effectively empathize with others and to overcome challenges and diffuse conflicts it is about decoding your mind and heart relationships and it is about unlocking the powers of both positive and negative emotion and ways to conquer your negative emotions and empower your positive emotions professional set is your sixth fulfillment empire which is much beyond enhancing your professional skills or career longevity or enhancing your paycheck it is more about fulfilling and living your career dreams by pursuing a career you love and loving what you do it is about busting your myths and limiting beliefs on professional success and failures it is about the essence of taking reasonable risk rather than regretting when it is too late in life it is about unlocking your career path and unleashing your true potential whether you are an employer or self employed business owner or an entrepreneur it is all about enriching your professional roots to build your professional legacy and footprints financial set is your seventh fulfillment empire if your professional set makes your living it is your financial set which makes your fortunes it is about the essence of financial literacy for attaining your financial goals we have tons of examples in human history where people made millions and billions in their professional life including big time lottery winners but they ended up in bankruptcy or with empty hands simply due to lack of financial literacy and financial discipline it is about building an empowering financial mindset and the essence of creating multiple sources of active and passive incomes to attain your financial freedom by unlocking the powers of your assets and liabilities towards your wealth creation social set is your eighth fulfillment empire where we human beings are inherently social creatures where we dream we work we learn and we grow part of our society it is about the essence of social life for all age groups right from toddlers to elderly people where research and studies have linked active social life with physical mental and emotional health including one's longevity it is about building and enriching your social awareness and conquering your loneliness and social anxiety it is about unlocking your social life treasures by embracing healthy social diet to detox unhealthy social connections 
and replacing them with positive empowering social connection in all facets of your life. Spiritual set is your ninth fulfillment empire where it is not about any specific religion or faith. It is all about connecting with nature and higher source. It is about the essence of raising your spiritual awareness, living consciously and being aware of what is happening in your body and mind in the present moment. It is about diffusing your ego by embracing compassion, forgiveness, openness to truth, curiosity and kindness and able to enjoy the little pleasures in the life to enrich your soul. It is about embracing the truth of mortality, the essence of graceful and regretless death rather than a fearful and regretful death. Philanthropic set is your 10th life fulfillment empire which gives the highest level of contentment in one's life. It is about the power of giving back and the essence of healthy traits of true philanthropy. It is about the essence of true spirit and emotional involvement in both givers and receivers. It is about giving back while you are living rather than regretting on your deathbed. It is about rewiring your philanthropic mindset beyond money and charity to embrace non-monetary philanthropy by giving back to your community and to nature by sharing your time, your experience and skills for creating a better world to live. It is about the essence of indirect philanthropy which is about doing one's own personal things in responsible ways by preventing or minimizing the potential harm to nature and to society in its first place. Life graduation is about attaining basic life mastery in all the 10 fulfillment empires. Similar to your academic graduation where you need to qualify in all the subjects. It doesn't matter if you have scored full or highest grades in few subjects but you have failed in one or more subject which simply means you haven't qualified for the graduation ceremony. Likewise, in your life graduation, you need to qualify in all fulfillment empires. If you fall short in any one life fulfillment empire, it simply means an incomplete life. It also means that you haven't life graduated yet. One may feel that some fulfillment empire doesn't matter in their lives. However, human history over centuries clearly states that every fulfillment empire matters the most. If not today, some or other day, it impacts Moreover, fulfillment empires are contagious both in negative and positive terms. On the positive side, if you conquer one fulfillment empire, it complements every other fulfillment empires. It works on one to many and many to one relationships. It is true for the negative side as well. If you deprive in one fulfillment empire, its sufferings and struggles spreads to all other fulfillment empires. Moreover, it diminishes whatever good you have attained in other fulfillment empires. More importantly, unlike your academic graduation, life graduation is not a one-time event to qualify where one needs to maintain basic life mastery in all those 10 life fulfillment empires throughout one's life journey. And I strongly believe Every human being on this planet deserves to attain life graduation to lead a truly fulfilled life for sustainable happiness and contentment in their lives. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for such an insightful talk. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Harini Madhira. Her 14 years of experience in the music industry and associations with various artists have helped carve a niche for herself in the event space and led to her founding the famous Cisne for Arts company. Let me start by asking you a question. Do you see a similarity between the teenagers and the 70 plus elderly? Now you find that strange, no? What you have probably heard traditionally a similarity between toddlers and the 70 plus because they're both childlike. So there is kind of a unsaid consensus, of course there's no data backing behind it, that typically teenagers and the 70 plus are known to be a little aloof. I mean people find it difficult or at least the middle-agers find it difficult to connect with them or they don't find the common topics. Let me start by telling you a small story. I'm often asked by my daughters, my teenager girls, to pick them up from the school on pretext of a play date or a, a music class or an extra class. And along with that comes the request of picking up their friends as well. And once these, these typically these pickups are uh, pick and drop are very meditative. 
because either side are very quiet. So either I'm concentrating on the road and these girls don't want to have a conversation or they're busy chit-chatting amongst themselves, hush-hushing their conversation. But recently when my daughter asked me, mom, can you pick me from school? And you know what? We need to drop three other friends to their respective places. And I was like, fine. And uh, when I reached the school, and the moment they were getting into my car, they got very excited because they heard this. I've been watching you for some time. Did that, do you know that track? Does that track also excite you? Did your eyes also twinkle? Yeah, so when all the four kids got into the car, they were super excited and they were shocked as well, pleasantly surprised. So they're like, wow, auntie, are you listening to this? Oh my God, she is my favorite singer. You know this song? Do you know that song? And then started the conversation and the next 15 minutes were total bonding between us. Now another incident, I was once uh, supposed to visit a friend uh, for a get together for a dinner. And uh, this friend of mine lives with her um, parents. And uh, when I went to their house, his parents were in their room and my friend told me they would want to be in their room and you know, they find it difficult to kind of connect um, to the, to the uh, middle-agers and have a conversation. So they would rather be in their room and you know, have their dinner in their room, which we all respect. Um, so because I was early, um, I offered to help her uh, lay the table and I said, okay, let me help you with the, with the arrangements. And while laying the table, I just happened to hum this. Shami hum ki khasam, aaj hum hi hai hum, abhi ja, abhi ja, aaj mere sanam, shami hum ki khasam. And I just sung two lines and suddenly I saw this old gentleman walk towards me and he said, Peter, were you singing that song? And I was little taken aback. I thought maybe I was not supposed to sing. My singing disturbed him or maybe I didn't or did I not sing the song correctly? Uh, so hesitantly I said, uh, yes, uncle. She so said, oh my God, uh, I love this song. This is my childhood. This is my favorite song. I can't believe that you listen to Talat Mahmood. And he said it with such astonishment because in his mind, somebody who was born in late 70s, which is, you know, as old as his daughter, and should be idly listening to somebody, a singers from 80s and 90s and so on. But here I was singing a song of a singer who's from 1950s and 60s, 70s. So he was absolutely elated. And there started another connection. And that evening we had innumerable conversations about music and his interests and other things. Has this ever happened to you? That you were in a room and full of strangers and you're thinking, oh my God, my mom has caught me somewhere. I don't know what I'm going to talk. Who am I going to talk? And you suddenly spotted a person who, who was surfing through a playlist which is similar to yours. Yes, you got this right. Music does connect people. It just doesn't connect people. It actually impacts your brain. And there are some proven studies on this that how music actually um, activates your each brain cells. It can help you concentrate. It can help you uh, uh, evaluate better, it makes your cognitive skills better. Once, I wanted to tell you one more story. Once when I was getting back from work and I just ha happened to enter the house with my key and what I witnessed was very, very interesting. Watch it. 
Okay, so are you done writing the periodic table? Mm -hmm. Tell me without looking what number 10 is. I don't know. Oh my god, my boo, we've been doing this for so long. You should be able to get it by now. Well, it's really hard because there's so many elements. How am I supposed to memorize them in order? True, true, true. Um, The way I learned it was actually through a song because writing didn't exactly help me memorize stuff, but music did. Um, So maybe I'll just teach you the song. Maybe okay. that'll make it easier for you. So repeat after me. There's hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen and helium. Lithium, beryllium. Lithium, beryllium. Boron carbon everywhere. Boron carbon everywhere. Nitrogen all through the air. Nitrogen all through the air. There's oxygen so you can breathe. Oxygen so you can breathe. And fluorine for your pretty teeth. Fluorine for your pretty teeth. Neon to light up the signs. Neon to light up the Tell me what number 10 is. Neon. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Yay. Good job. You got it. So I guess music does make it easier for you to learn, so. I can see that. Yeah. These are my two teenager girls. My little one apparently was struggling to remember or prepare for her chemistry exam the next day. And she wanted to get her periodic table right. And here her older sister is helping her crack this with music. It's very interesting how music, and that's when it occurred to me, that was my aha moment. And I thought, how beautiful it would be if we taught the life's most difficult lessons through music and people would always remember it. In fact, I don't know if you've noticed that music actually, each note, and again, this is scientifically proven, touches your mind and your uh, chakras in a manner that it activates different moods. That is why when you are probably not so happy, you listen to a little bit more melancholy music. But if you are in a gym, you would want to have little fast paced kind of a music which would pump up your energy. If you're studying a little lilting um, instrumental music, kind you helps you concentrate better and if you are going to go party with your friends trust me what would you want nice dancing music correct so yes so musical notes the permutation combination of those bring out a different emotion each time and connects with you or with your brain in a different manner which actually helps you rejuvenate or react in a particular manner. That is why when you're listening to certain songs, it makes you cry. And there are certain songs which emotes love through and through. This is very interesting that people actually make a mistake of looking at music only as an extracurricular activity. Or if you think, you think I don't have it in me to become a professional. Actually, music is within us, in each one of us. It is part of us. It is not about taking it as a profession. Music is part of your growing up years, part of your, your, your system. Music helps you understand maths better, comprehend better, like I mentioned earlier. In fact, there are many research which have been done that doctors who are who've been into music are are able to you know treat people better engineers who are into music are able to crack more problems music doesn't have to be taught to be a professional in fact a child listens to music music is something the child listens listens before even he or she is born right inside a mother's womb in the form of a heartbeat. Lap tap, lap tap, lap tap. The, the sound of the heartbeat is so rhythmic that the child is known, is, is, gets the rhythm from his mother's womb. At this juncture, I would just leave you guys with one thought. All of you, if you start listening and learning music, 
to become a better architect, better engineer, better doctor. Forget about that. Just a better human being. And above all, you are never alone, ever, because you have your companion in music. Thank you. Uh, so this is a song that, it's an instrumental rock song that I composed. It's called Woven From Dreams. So. talk is guaranteed to inspire you to bring about a change. We have a Padma Shri awardee, Shri Sham Sundar Paliwal, popularly known as the father of eco-feminism. He has beautifully combined and secured two essential aspects by planting 111 trees on the birth of every girl child in his panchayat. What was once considered a barren land 
now has more than 3.5 lakh trees with the female feticide rate being absolutely zero. I for one cannot wait for this talk. Namaskar. My name is Sam Sundar Paliwal. I am in Rasamand, in Piplantri, in the city of Pani, Pedh, Gochar, Bhumi, and Vanya Jeeva. I have been working on the Prakarthi Gadar Trozgar. I have been working on the last 20 years. We have tried to make a decision 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 to make a decision. बड़े स्तर पर जल संरक्षण वृक्षारोपण बेटी बचाओ बेटी पढ़ाओ ये कहे कि बेटी पानी पेड़ गोचर भूमि क्योंकि पेड़ों को सरकारी जमीनों में लगाना पड़ेगा आज बड़े स्तर पर सरकारी जमीनों पर जो गांव के लिए आरक्षित भूमि है उन जमीनों पर अतिक्रमण हो रहा है अवैध माइनिंग हो रहा है अवैध रूप से कचरा डाला जा रहा है उन जमीनों को खुर्द बुर्द किया जा रहा है अवैध कॉलोनियां बस रही है तो ये कहें कि गांव में बेटी का जन्म हुआ तो बेटियों के नाम पर पेड़ लगाना पेड़ सरकारी जमीनों में लगाना पेड़ों को पानी देने के लिए पानी को जमीन को पानीदार बनाने के लिए बड़े स्तर पर जल संरक्षण का काम करना और बड़े स्तर पर जल संरक्षण वृक्षारोपण का काम हुआ तो फिर वन्य जीव भी अपने आप आने लग जाएंगे और बचे बचेंगे तो ये कहें कि बेटी पानी पेड़ गोचर भूमि और वन्य जीवों को बचाकर लोगों को प्राकृतिक आधारित रोजगार प्राकृतिक आधारित रोजगार जैसे पानी हुआ तो किसान खेती करेगा अच्छी नस्ल के पशु रखेगा तो जिससे वन्य जीव भी बचेंगे किसान भी आत्मनिर्भर होगा किसान आत्मनिर्भर होगा तो पशुपालन भी होगा पशुपालन होगा तो घर में घी दूध होगा और घी दूध होगा तो कुपोषण मिटेगा इस तरह के काम करके हम लोगों को लगातार रोजगार देने पर काम कर सकते हैं और ये आज हम सब लोगों के लिए बहुत ही आवश्यक हो गया है क्योंकि कोरोना जैसी महामारियां रुक नहीं रही है अगर कोई वैक्सीन आता है तो उसको उसके बदले दूसरा वेरिएंट आ रहा है जो जिसको रोकथाम नहीं हो पा रही है और इसका एकमात्र कारण है कि अगर हम सब लोग चाहें तो इस प्रकृति को प्रकृति में बनाकर इस पृथ्वी को प्रकृति में बनाकर हम लोग इन महामारियों से मुकाबला कर सकते हैं आइए आप और हम सब मिलकर सरकारी संसाधनों से सरकार की योजनाओं को जन सहभागिता से जोड़कर हमारे गांव में इस तरह के काम करें हमारे कार्य क्षेत्र में इस तरह के काम करें जिससे पानी की समस्या खत्म हो प्रदूषण की समस्या खत्म हो और एक बेरोजगारी जैसी बड़ी समस्या जो आ रही है वो भी खत्म हो और हमारे गांव आदर्श गांव बने और गांव आदर्श बनाने के लिए पहले हमें आदर्श बनना पड़ेगा तब जाकर हमारे गांव आदर्श बनेंगे गांव प्रकृति से जुड़े और फिर पर्यटन ग्राम बने इस पर हम सब लोग मिलकर काम करें क्योंकि देखिए हमारा गांव हमारे लिए सबसे बड़ा तीर्थ स्थान है और उस तीर्थ स्थान को विकसित करने के लिए सरकार और दानदाता अगर उसमें सहयोग करते हैं तो फिर हमें सबको मिलकर जन सहभागिता से इस तरह के गांवों का निर्माण करना पड़ेगा जिससे गाँव से शहरों की तरफ पलायन नहीं हो और ये पलायन एक बहुत बड़ी बीमारी माँ फैल रही है जिसको रोकना पड़ेगा गाँव से शहरों की तरफ शहरों की आबादी बढ़ रही है गाँवों की आबादी दिन दिन पर कम हो रही है इसको भी रोकना पड़ेगा आइए हम सब मिलकर इस पर काम करें बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद आई नाउ प्रेजेंट द टॉक बाय मनीषा नायर अ होलिस्टिक लिविंग एंथ्यूजियास्ट एंड योगा स्पेशलिस्ट एंड थेरेपिस्ट पर्टिकुलरली बिलीविंग इन द ट्रू हीलिंग पावर ऑफ प्रणायाम एंड ब्रेथ वर्क इट्स अ पैशन टू मेक इट प्लेन टू द वर्ल्ड दैट योगा इज फॉर एवरी regardless of any demographic Hi everyone I'm sure all of us think about what we want to be when we are little When I was a kid my biggest ambition was to be a superhero a superhero seriously <laughs> sounds kind of silly you know but I'm going to tell you more about that in just a little while First, when I say the words yoga, breathing, meditation, what do you think? What comes to your mind? Does it all sound really dull, boring and tedious? Well, think again. It's not. My name is Manisha. 
I'm a yoga therapist and I'm here to tell you why yoga is really cool. Let me begin by telling you what a yoga therapist is. It's just someone who works personally with each student, tunes into their specific problems and goals and helps them to heal using the tools of yoga. It could be a problem with the body like an illness or an injury or it could be an emotional issue that you're struggling with. As a yoga therapist, I help you deal with not just the physical aches and pains on the outside, but I also help you manage and deal the stresses that you have on the inside. Here, inside and here. Okay, so back to the beginning. Remember what I always wanted to be? A yoga therapist. Hell no. A superhero. Seriously. So as a child, I really loved to read and I loved stories. I was so inspired by the whole superhero genre. It called out to me. The whole thing with twin identities, changing from a nobody to a somebody, going out there like a hero and fighting crime, helping people. I think that was what it really was all about for me. I really wanted to help people. And I was really serious about being a superhero. And so I spent a lot of my childhood in training. Training to fight, jump, change costumes in lightning speed, do cool karate chops and judo kicks, scaling up and down trees, pipes, buildings. And here's the kicker, training my breath. I chanced upon that last one by accident. So in my mind as a child, I believed that a superhero would be in all kinds of dangerous situations with monsters, villains, bad people, and that I needed to learn to pretend to be dead by stopping my breath. And as I kept experimenting with holding my breath, I discovered this amazing process of slowing down that breath. And I realized that you can actually breathe so softly, so, slow, so slowly and so smoothly that it seems like you're not breathing at all. This was my first taste of pranayama. I'm going to ask you all to join me and do this little exercise. Can you hold your hand up to your nostril like this? Just under the nostril. Take a nice deep breath in and breathe out a nice natural breath out, feeling that air against your hand. See how that felt? Okay, now we're going to do this one more time. Take your hand up, take another deep breath in and let it out. And this time, breathe out so slowly that you can't feel it against your own hand. Slow, smooth, subtle, soft, in slow motion. I'm sure most of you are succeeding quite well at this point. And some of you have managed to do it so slowly that you can't feel that breath against your hand at all. And those of you who can still feel it, I'm sure and I bet that it's much, much lighter than the very first time that we just tried it. Yeah? Okay. So welcome folks to the world of pranayama. So I'd love for you to try this on your own and experiment with how you can play with the breath and how smooth you can make your own breath. This is just one small example of the countless cool things that we can do with our breath. The possibilities of working with the breath are limitless and so are the benefits. So I only realized later that what I had stumbled upon as a kid was in fact a very powerful tool and technique used in yoga, breath work. Have you noticed how when we are faced with a stressful situation in our life, our whole body goes cold, the stomach knots up, the breath becomes short and fast the mind becomes a complete mess. Stress affects our body, our breath and our mind in a big way. And this ultimately leads to poor immunity, illness and disease. How do we deal with this? Through yoga. Yoga makes this possible. Yoga helps us to find the strength, balance, to deal with adversity and our problems by working equally on the body, the breath and the mind. So at the level of the body, it works with posture, movement and form to make us healthier and fitter. Yoga postures make you more flexible, improves the stamina, builds endurance and strength. 
It enhances sporting ability and is great for runners, swimmers and athletes of all kinds. All you fitness freaks, gym goers, six packs aspirants, you think yoga is not for you? Trust me, it is and it will improve your performance in the gym because yoga is unique. It combines breath into the movement and posture, which increases the efficiency and effectiveness of your entire gym workout. In yoga, it is believed that we are all given a limited number of breaths in our lifetime. So if we can slow down our breaths and breathe consciously, we can actually live longer. The lesser breaths we take, the lesser the strain on our lungs, lesser the wear and tear, and the healthier and younger our heart. Longer life? Sounds logical to me. Can you see how important breathing exercises would be during the coronavirus pandemic? This is a virus that actually attacks our respiratory system, our heart and our lungs. We all knew breathing was important. Duh. I mean, if we don't breathe, we don't live, right? But never have we realized the importance of having a strong respiratory and immune system more than during this awful pandemic. Breathing exercises or pranayama improve the lung function and strengthen the heart and the entire respiratory system and works wonders on our overall immunity. But yoga is not just about the body and the breath. It's also about the mind. There is so much stress in our everyday lives now, especially in today's fast-paced world with so much competition. There's a constant struggle we face to fit in. This is more and more obvious today than it was ever before. These challenges and feelings take up a lot of our physical stamina, our emotional energy and our mental space. We've all felt stress at every age, adults and children alike. You know that dreaded feeling before exams? Overwhelmed with work, looming deadline, a fight with a sibling or a friend, disagreement with our parents, feeling frustrated, angry and sad. We've all felt scared because we're being bullied or pressure because of our peers. We felt helpless, not understood, lonely, hurt, abandoned, rejected. Feels like the whole world is coming crashing down on us. Yoga works wonders in calming the mind when we are tense. It reduces stress, depression and anxiety and it makes you feel relaxed. And it makes you clear-headed sharp, focused and steady and ready to take on any challenge that you have to face with positivity. Didn't you actually feel a sense of calm and relaxation from that first breathing exercise that we did? And if not, I would love for you to try that again as I said before, on your own. Do it just 10 times for 10 breaths and see how it feels. So basically yoga is about finding this perfect balance between the body, the breath and the mind. Yoga is not an action of contorting your body into some like bizarre posture or doing a bunch of fast breaths up and down, in and out. It's about how we feel, a state of balance, being aware of our thoughts and acting mindfully, thinking before we act, considered and conscious decisions instead of mindless, impulsive actions. It is the difference between reacting and responding. We can all achieve this state of balance in everything that we do. For example, it could be cooking or doing art or playing music. If we do it with full attention and energy and focus, that would be yoga. Not just in our ordinary life, we can even manage to keep calm and respond instead of reacting in highly stressful situations. Let me tell you a scary story, a true scary story. 10 years ago, I was in my home alone, lying on my bed, chilling, checking mail. Suddenly, there were two intruders in my room. Before I knew it, they both charged at me and pinned me down, head against the wall and a knife at my throat. I had no time to even blink. I was in the worst nightmare of my life. Initially, I was petrified and panic-stricken. Everything went black around me and I thought I was going to pass out. But in that moment, I suddenly decided to try to slow my breath down. 
And within 10 or 15 seconds, this really calmed me down and allowed me to think clearly. And I suddenly knew what action I had to take or how to fight. Thankfully, I was able to keep my wits about me enough to fight them off. Yes, literally kicking, beating, punching, while also shouting and screaming loudly to get attention from my neighbors. After about a minute or so, I think I became too difficult for them to handle in an apartment, neighbors, so they decided to beat a hasty retreat. Scary as all hell, but a lucky escape for me. In just those few moments of breathing, it let me focus, not on the fear and the panic, but on the actual situation at hand and what I could do about it. I was able to respond instead of just blindly reacting. And this, my friends, is what I believed saved my life. End of story time. But this was a real example from my life that showed the true power of controlling the breath and how it leads to a better presence of mind. If we can practice being mindful in everything that we do, even in the very difficult situations, we can choose the best and most effective action for ourselves. Remember when I said that as a yoga therapist, I help you work with your aches and pains of the body on the outside and also on the stresses and worries that you have on the inside. This inside-outside balance is yoga and the breath is the connecting tool between the two. Imagine how it would feel to have this kind of beautiful control over your body, breath and mind and how amazing it would be to feel balanced and calm inside. Imagine this. Your body is fit. Your immunity is strong. Your breath is steady. Your thoughts are calm and your mind is clear and sharp. Nothing can hurt you. You're pretty indestructible. Sounds quite like a superhero to me. <laughs> Maybe we can all be superheroes after all. Not just me, but you too. What do you think? This is Manisha once again. I am a yoga therapist and I hope I've been able to convince you at least just a little bit that yoga is cool. Thank you for listening. Well, that was an interesting talk. We now have Ravi Tabiru, an outdoor educator, author, and coach. He helps his children to reach their limitless potential by coaching them to be deep thinkers, mastering them to ace deliberate practice, and amplifying their mental toughness with his Himalayan semester. Children witness an increase in self-worth and self-reliance, and I'm sure so will the rest of us at the end of his talk. It was 2004 and uh, I was like each one of you was really wanted to do something and was stuck at a point in business where I was not progressing the way I intended to. And that was when uh, I was contemplating and decided what is the next mountain? What is the peak that I need to go ahead and conquer? That was the epiphany moment for me. That was when I realized I need to take a train up to the mountains, go up and discover what has life got in store for me. There were a lot of these thoughts which are happening in my mind when I got this epiphany, what is my uh, next mountain. And as I mentioned, I took this train, I landed in Kadgodam and I went to this place called Mukteshwar. The first sight of the mighty Himalayas, the snow-capped mountains, <laughs> It was overwhelming. As I speak to you now, I get, I'm getting all goosebumps. That sight gave me a visual of what lies ahead of me in life. That got me the humility of who I, who I am. Uh, I was looking into problems like really, really too close. I was at the edge and looking at the vast vistas, realized that this is a journey that I need to take and the mountains gave me the metaphor just like an adventurer just like an explorer to take those steps this thought came of what's my next mountain it was an 
incredible epiphany moment for me and i started jotting down my journey as i booked my one way ticket to kadgudam that's the hub of uttaranchal as you might be knowing and this is when i realized that i need to figure out who am i am i an adventurer am i on a path to discover myself and the mountains offered me the perfect metaphor that i've been looking for i went up to mukteshwar and the first visuals of the mighty himalayas the snow capped mountains i was overwhelmed it was it was a moment that i can't express but i had a huge breakthrough in life this breakthrough i realized uh, was just because i saw the enormousness of the nature of the mountains the valley right next to me when i stood on the cliff gave me that perspective of what life is all about i was so close to the problems that I was unable to see what was lying ahead of me and this was what life has intended to be to take this journey to take the path ahead the path ahead was very very clear it was a chance to look deeper inside uh, to reflect upon to understand that the journey is so very very critical and that was the start of how i started reframing my life and it was 2004 uh it was absolutely pristine a world all together uh this was the start of the journey so this uh, opportunity to look inwards started uh, my journey towards life and this is something which i always felt that we as individuals should be able to reach out to nature to connect and what best than himalayas to start this reflection point so after a couple of days uh, it was very interesting i had a lot of thoughts in my mind uh, my friend a dear friend came to pick me up and we drove down to satdal right from almost 8000 9000 feet we were going to satdal uh, beautiful forest by the time we reached uh, it was almost like pitch dark uh, the road was winding and winding and this darkness sort of added a little drama to the whole journey i was in the open top jeep my friend was driving after a couple of minutes he said hey ravi let me just back it and he started backing it the moment he started backing it there were millions of thoughts which were running in my mind why did he stop why was he backing it up and i looked at him and he said Ravi I think there's a leopard it was total contrast to what was happening in my life and immediately after a couple of minutes when he backed up and I could see this leopard this big cat right just about 3 feet it was total contrast to what was happening is this is everything going to come to an end what next this what next uh, moment was uh made me realize that i was so close to probably death it made me realize that time is just a finite it's limited it gave me a perspective that that that, that. What next that was something that was quickly running in my mind it was extremely cold uh, uh and i was sweating at the same time and when i could see this big cat staring at me i was frozen time just stood still i didn't know what was happening but then i as the jeep began to proceed ahead i realized time is finite we all have a very very limited period in our life and this was the perspective that i got we need to maximize each and every moment and nature offers this brilliant perspective of putting things in its place and as i continue to progress in my life i always look back at these two differently contrasting moments of how it helped me shape as an individual and i also as i continue to grow in life and in business i look upon these moments just like any other adventurer just like any other explorer where you are going to face a lot of highs uh, and a lot of lows and it is how we take those moments by hand and how do we use the reflection makes us who we are
So as I continued to work in, the, in this domain, where I continued to work with a lot of children and young adults, there was one particular moment which clearly was yet another reflective uh, moment for me. So there was this young 13-year-old boy who was brilliant, who was very well built, uh, good at sports, good at studies. And I had his class traveling with me in the outdoors for their camp, for the seven-day camp. And uh, uh, this boy was interested in leadership. So he was, uh, by default, the leader. Uh, because each and every teacher around, every child looked upon to him and he performed his duties uh, seamlessly. A couple of days, uh, we were crossing a valley and we rigged this place up where we need to rappel down. He, like an able leader, ensured that there was safety. So this boy was like the default leader. He ensured that each and every child went down, rappel down. but. When it was his chance to get down of that, you know, probably uh, close to a hundred feet uh, rock where he needs to rappel down, he refused to. There were a lot of coaxing, there was a lot of motivation which was going around. Uh, he just could not. And uh, I realized, uh, and I was watching it from behind, this boy broke down. There were a lot of myriad of thoughts which were running across his mind. And I was observing. A couple of days uh, later, during the camp, he realized that he was vulnerable too. And he had this moment, he had this huge breakthrough that it is okay to feel vulnerable. And when I was talking to him, he shared that the same perspective that being in the nature, being in the outdoors helped him to connect with himself, to understand that he has limitations too. The beauty of life is to accept these limitations and within these limitations we need to understand what is the journey that we are taking. And when you have this journey, when you are exposed to the mountains, when you are exposed to the outdoors, it teaches what classrooms cannot clearly teach. It helps us to connect with our inner soul and it brings out the true character of who we are. Every child, if you are a parent listening to this, every child should be given an opportunity to go out, to be in the outdoors. Primarily, we are all outdoorsy folks. So if we go ourselves immerse in the nature, most of the times nature has the answers and we need to have the awareness to look deep inside ourselves and the answers are right there. Each one of us will go through the journeys of ups and downs and nature as a metaphor will fasten the process, will fasten the realization that we are one with the nature and we can find answers to what we are looking for. My life in these three segments gave me a lot of perspective to look at and nature was the greatest bond to connect so now every child should be exposed to nature so let us give each and every child a chance to explore to connect because the answers are inside us let us give our children a chance to find their inner hero and the outdoors is the best way to have this transition happen So this uh, mashup or medley that I made um, is between Tori Kelly and Arjit Singh, two singers that I absolutely adore. So um, Tori Kelly is uh, really famous in pop and she's just the queen of runs and like R&B. So I love her. And then Arjit Singh, obviously, as you all know, like he's just amazing. So um, yeah, enjoy this uh, little um, Bollywood and Western pop medley. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm.
All right. Um, also, Namrata, ma'am, I hope you can watch out for my Hindi here. <laughs> so um, since like seventh grade. <laughs> um, all right. La ta ta da ti, I'm not breaking me. La ti ta da ta, ain't got time for ya singing. La ta ta da ti, I'm not breaking me. La ti ta da ta, got an unbreakable smile. Dressed up, got my heart messed up. You got yours, and I got mine. It's unfair that I still care, and I wonder where you are tonight. Thinking it could be different, but maybe we missed it. Thinking it could be different, it could, it could. It should have been us. Should have been a vibe. Should have been a perfect storm. It should have been us. Could have been a real thing. Now we'll never know for sure. We were crazy, but amazing, baby. We both know should have been us. us. It, it, it should have been us. When did I did I? 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 When did I mere yaah meliya ho gaya janna mere yaah mere yaah janna mere yaah mere yaah janna mere yaah mere yaah कैसे तेरे खुद करे जी किसी ठोरे टिके ना पाओ कैसे तेरे खुद करे जी किसी ठोरे टिके ना पाओ बन लिया अपना पे अंबर कर लिया तू साथ समंदर फिर भी सूखा मन के अंदर क्यों रहेगा मान जा रे फकीरा Our last speaker requires no introduction since his work speaks for himself. We have the owner of the biggest sports production studio setup in eastern India catering to re regional, national and international films. With 20 years of experience and expertise in cinema, we have Deepankar Jojo Chaki. The masters have always said that 50% of the movie watching experience is audio. And it is my job to create that sonic experience as a movie sound designer. Hi, I'm Deepankar Chaki. I'm a sound designer. I have sound designed films like Pink, October, Gulabo Sitabo, Sardar Udham. And I have won two national awards, uh, one Filmfare Award, one Z Award, and one Mahanayak Samman Award. Today, I will share a bit of my journey with you. It all starts with storytelling. And, uh, you know, as in movie or film, you know, we see a story and, you know, the the creator is trying to tell a story through the medium of visual and sound. So sound forms a very important uh, integral element to the narrative of storytelling in cinema. Uh, this manipulation of sound to create uh, the world of the movie that you know we are basically making or showing and uh, the, the different aspects of the usage of sound to basically influence uh, different segments of storytelling is what we call sound design. 
it involves uh, the knowledge of uh, you know like uh, cinema it involves to have the knowledge of technology and of course uh, the aesthetics of art so uh, sound design i would say ideally lies at the intersections of technology and art and cinema a little bit about my personal journey as a sound designer uh, i had started studying in calcutta uh, and moved into engineering uh, while i was doing my studies in engineering i was also into music i was personally uh, very influenced by the rock music uh, of that era and uh, was part of a band as a bass player and uh, post my engineering i i was really keen and interested to basically get into live sound because you know it, it really uh, impacted me to a great degree that you know like when such a huge audience is sitting in a stadium or theater and you know like listening to a band there's one person who's sitting right in behind and controlling the entire system and uh, this actually came out of one of my experiences uh, earlier in life when i gone to see a live concert uh, of the rolling stones and i saw that there was a gentleman sitting right behind and controlling the sound of the rolling stones and it struck me that it never, it never occurred to me that you know that rolling stones you know a band like that would need to have somebody so uh, efficient and so talented to basically you know represent them and their sound to the audience who's listening to it and uh, he was uh, handling this massive system of uh, you know some 25 30000 watts and controlling every aspect of it so it fascinated me so that's how i think my interest started in in the sound business you know and uh, post that i kind of got into studio sound which is basically you know recording so as a musician my natural uh, journey was to basically get into music recording and uh, i had then done uh, music recording for many years multiple years i had been doing music recording for uh, songs for films with working with dj's working with uh, independent artists with their albums and uh, got uh, really exposed to a foray of instruments to different kinds of uh, situations where artists uh, required to create a certain kind of sound you know beat percussive beat uh, like a melodic instrument and this really gave me a lot of exposure into how the recording uh, you know t technology works how we basically like to listen to something that is pleasant from there my journey went on to uh, basically working with smaller films where you know like uh, we needed to do sound effects we needed to work with voiceovers and with that i also learned a lot about the human voice dialogues about sound effects a little about foley and i think there on i plunged completely into the world of cinema which is fascinating because i think uh, movies actually encompass the entire gamut of artistic uh, possibilities uh, because we were working with dialogue as well as music as well as songs as well as uh, sound effects and foley and all put together to kind of create a certain kind of impact on the viewer's mind about how the story is being told and uh, and being successful at it you know and to create an immersive experience of that with my experience of having done you know a lot of the music work and the recordings it it and, and and a lot of the foley recordings uh, you know which we do as live action uh, foley like footsteps and small incidental sounds to make the film come to life i i thought that i was ready to now plunge into a different aspect of cinema which was sound design and i think sound design is possibly one of the most interesting practices in our fraternity one of the big reasons is being that sound is an intangible form you know uh, it is something that you cannot see and feel and touch of course so uh, it's something that always uh, lies in the subconscious when you experience the movie so when you are watching a film you have no idea that how sound is actually impacting you because uh, your mind is engaged more on the visual and the sound is actually working on your subconscious and hence you know if you see like you know an example a good example would be a horror film 
where you know you see a character who's uh, maybe you know uh, walking through a dark corridor and is is very scared but the sounds will be basically the you know the the i mean set up you know it will it will set up the whole scene it will set up the the amount of uh, fear that you know we want to create it will also give you the whole uh, feeling of you know like what to expect because the minute you know that everything is going like low and quiet something is about to happen and then boom there's a bang sound i mean you know something like a loud sound that will completely throw you off so i think those are the kind of powers that sound has you know in 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 its own way and uh, there's uh, there are multiple ways in which we can manipulate it in a movie i would like to draw a few examples of such kind uh, while we are doing a movie you know with sound we can basically set a mood or a feeling like you know we are suppose for example it's a romantic setting and we see this uh, beautiful uh, you know uh, woman sitting in a garden and uh, you know waiting for uh, her man to come in and you know it's supposed to be a romantic setting so then the garden that is around her has to be designed in a certain way where it is beautiful you know like you know the kind of birds because we must remember that in cinema all the sounds that we are hearing you know is basically put you know by the sound designer in addition the sound editor actually in addition to what has been recorded on location so on location sounds are uh, basically uh, mainly the dialogue and uh, the rest of the effects sounds very realistic and doesn't create the sense of the world that you want to build in a movie so the entire world building exercise is done later at the post production stage in sound studios where the director will sit with the sound designer and break down scenes and say ki okay in this scene i'm i'm looking at the scene like this you know like uh, it, it's absolutely you know beautiful uh, kind of a setting and we wanted to you know, want to put the audience in this kind of a mood so uh, we would do the sound effects in such a way that you know the audience would actually feel that that you know they are in that garden which is beautiful there's you know small birds which are chirping there's a little wind the leaves are rustling so how we choose the different elements of sound to basically put it together in a way to create that kind of a mood and setting is what our, i mean we have to do our job is well um when we are watching a movie we also have something which is called pacing like how fast a movie is you know moving from from shot to shot scene to scene sequence to sequence so there are certain times in certain scenes or certain sequences where we feel the need that you know we need to i mean you know like speed up the the viewing experience now the visual might be moving at a certain pace but it is possible to some extent to pace up the actual experience of viewing by you know like designing the sound in a certain way like for example uh, you know i see this girl who's sitting on a railway platform and uh, you know she she's just uh, you know looking at the floor and there's no sound but i need and and, and the shot is quite long and 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 i need to basically pace up this shot so i can put the sound of a train which i don't see on the shot i can put a sound of the train which is passing by you know and that would kind of you know like pace up that sequence just to give an example to understand what i really am trying to say so this in this way you know like we can also use sound design to pace up certain segments of a scene also very importantly i think you know you can use sound to define geographical locations for example uh, you are sitting under a tree and we we just see the uh, person on the tree you know like uh, who's being shot for example and uh, there is nothing else that we see but uh, from the point of view of sound we can add certain elements to that place for example what if we place you know a waterfall next to it what if we are looking at them and you know like we hear the sound of say an aeroplane or a helicopter which is passing overhead it could also be a car it could be a motorcycle 
uh, it could also very well be, you know, like uh, very close to a factory and, you know, there's some kind of a industrial sound. Now, how would we choose what sound to use? It would be totally dependent on what's happening on the scene, you know. What is the, what is the you know, uh, protagonist or what is the character going through? What is the context of that scene? And then with that, we will bring in, you know, like these kind of elements. What is the story about? You know, like if it's a, if it's a story that is about, say, a relationship drama, that's, uh, that's a certain way to handle things. Then if the story is a thriller or like a, a mystery film, then, you know, like there's a certain way we can do things, you know. But the idea is always that, you know, these are cues that we are giving to the audience to, you know, like they, which they're putting together in their, in their head, adding up and trying to find some kind of meaning or pattern to what's really going on. You know, they're trying to decode the film and the cues are being subconsciously given by us. So that is how also, you know, a sound design kind of, I would say, plays with your uh, mind while it is, uh, you know, trying to decode a movie. A very important thing is also uh, time, you know, like in a, f a time in a film, like there are certain times when we uh, we see that it's, uh, it's day or it's night, but then, you know, like day also has its different hours, you know, like, you know, if it's early, it's midday, it's late afternoon. And then I think uh, in the evening uh, or, uh, you know, I mean, in the night time, basically, it can be divided into early evening, late evening, night, late night, you know, in that way, you know. Uh, so I think all these different segments of time have different sounds. So when it's a very early morning, you would really not have many people wake up. So, you know, like there will be less activity. So let's say like exactly how we see how in our daily lives, you know, like early morning is mainly we, we hear birds, we hear some people, we, there, there's some kind of a pleasantness in the overall scene. And then uh, when it comes to, when it comes to like midday, there's a lot of activity because there's traffic, there's people traveling, there's work happening, there's some kind of construction work happening, you know, like overall, you know, in the neighborhood or in, in a city. These are the things that take place, right? So similarly in the night, you know, like you would hear activity when it's like early evening, late evening, you know, things will slowly pan out and very, very late night or night, you know, like you would hear very little bit and, you know, just hear the atmospheric uh, sounds, you know, like you could hear maybe the, the night guards whistle or you can hear a dog which is barking like two lanes away. So these are the elements, these are the, uh, you know, ideas that are basically implemented into the way we design the sound for our movies. Besides this, we have another very important uh, feature is how we can define a character. We can define a very strong character by the use of very strong footsteps or, you know, like maybe he's a police officer, as a military person, then he would have really heavy footsteps or something like that. We can define a woman or a feminine character similarly with earrings, with, you know, like uh, ornaments and uh, footsteps, which would have, say, if she's wearing a heels or something like that. So automatically the characters get a lot of definition in terms of their personality. So uh, there is a possibility to kind of establish a lot of personality uh, traits in a person through the sound design. Uh, besides this, you know, there is also ways to heighten realism, you know, uh, heighten possibly attention to detail, you know, like then we can also create dramatic effects like, you know, and uh, even cause uh, shock and startle like, you know, if in a horror film, you suddenly see these, uh, you know, uh, loud sounds which will completely scare you suddenly. So those are basically intended to startle you. These are in total some of the very small applications that we have towards sound design. Of course, there's a whole technology side to it. There's, uh, you know, entirely there's a whole associative study side to it for every film that we work on. And, uh, you know, it just helps because 
when finally end of the day you're working with you know creating sounds you're going out and recording them you're working with music you're working with song and uh, putting it all together you know uh, it's just sheer entertainment i mean it's entertainment for you first and if it's uh, something that's working on you it's going to work on the audience for sure i can say with absolute assurance that every talk has been as awe inspiring as the next i for one feel a spring in my step already now the only con today is that unfortunately our event has to come to an end i thank every speaker for taking part in tedx glendale academy your contribution to our event has been of utmost value to us now before i hand over the program to my mentors i would just like to thank them for giving me the opportunity to host tedx for the second time it is such a great learning experience and a great journey to be involved in i am now an alumni of glendale academy and yet it still continues to help me involve in so many aspects and for and for that i will be forever grateful thank you everyone today for your patience with me and i'm very sorry if i've made any blunders thank you and <laughs> until next time I'd like to hand over the program now to my mentors. Thank you Hana for weaving this program so beautifully and seamlessly. A warm evening to one and all. It's an absolute honor and privilege hosting TEDx Glendale Academy for the third time with a number of luminaries representing various fields and parts of the world. I take this opportunity to extend my sincerest thanks to all my speakers for their distinct thoughts and ideas showcased in their talks. I am highly indebted to them for accepting my request and taking out precious time from their busy schedule. Thank you Ajit sir, Bimal sir, Shweta, Pallavi, Ganesh, Sundar sir, Joan, Jeremy, Harini, Manisha Ravi and Deepanka sir at the same time we are extremely grateful to our audience for being with us throughout the evening we are pretty sure that these talks and ideas would have touched everyone's heart in one way or the other teamwork divides the task and multiplies the success putting up such an extremely wonderful event was possible only due to unconditional support of our talented team at Glendale i am extremely grateful to my superior ms minu saluja who is the executive producer of the event ms hana our event manager and mc the designers mr samuel and mr satish communications editorial and marketing director ms komal thank you everyone once again from the bottom of my heart for witnessing our much look forward to event at glendale a very good bye until we meet again next year with a constellation of star speakers from our galaxy Music